Good morning. Our St. Margaret's meditation today comes from Matthew 23, verses 1 to 12. And the heading for this chapter is Seven Woes to the, scri to the Scribes and the Pharisees. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do, for they preach but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all the deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries, phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honour at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest amongst you shall be your servant. Whosoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whosoever humbles himself will be exalted. There endeth the reading. But that chapter carries on along the theme of the seven woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. The reading is a prime example. The reading today is a prime example um, of um, why all biblical readings need to be read in the widest possible context and not in isolation. The lectionary, which we largely share with other branches of the church, such as the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox, is a wonderful selection of small readings suitable for homilies and sermons and linked with the Christian calendar. But it does lead to a loss of context and can therefore lead to misleading conclusions and spurious messages. This 23rd chapter of Matthew's Gospel <clears throat> is a veritable diatribe by Jesus against the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the temple authorities and is quite vitriolic in places. It castigates their hypocrisy and self-love, their self-absorption, their self-serving, self-importance and self-preening. Given that the gospel early on has Jesus on a mountain like Moses and preaching the Beatitudes, a new interpretation of the law which is compassionate and loving, how can Jesus now let forth with this tirade against the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Well, context, context, context. If you want a sort of timeline for the events in the life of Jesus, you'd go to the earliest of the Synoptic Gospels, that of Mark, John Mark, to give him his full name. And he was held by the early church to be the son of Mary, in whose upper room the Last Supper was held, uh, clearly not a semi-detached house. And he would probably have been around the household at the time of the meal, and maybe, maybe he helped. Um, maybe his mother, sensing the tension in the upper room, sent her son to follow Jesus, or maybe he was just curious and wanted to see where they were going for himself. But the early church, church tradition has it that he is the young man who lost his garment in the Garden of Gethsemane and ran naked. 
away from there. A detail that wasn't an integral part of the events that he was describing in the garden. It was a sort of incidental which eyewitnesses would add as they picture events. And it is noted only by Mark, a, a personal detail. Subsequently, he was close to Peter, the leader of the Jewish church, and also went on Paul's first missionary journey with him. And finally, he was in Rome with Peter and Paul during their imprisonment and their martyrdom in about AD 64. So he is what you might call a close player in all of the events about which he wrote, a first-hand prime witness. So it's not surprising that the other gospel writers respected his account and quote quite extensively from his gospel. Not that his timeline would necessarily have been absolutely accurate, but taken with Luke's Gospel, it must be as accurate as you can get about the sequence of events, of events in the ministry of Jesus. But you can't say that of Matthew's Gospel. As we have said before, Matthew's Gospel is patterned on the Pentateuch. And the five sections would be headed, could be headed, the birth narrative, the missionary vocation of the church, the life of the church and the Messiah comes in judgment with a prologue and an epilogue. And so Matthew had to shuffle things around and reorder parts of Jesus' ministry and his teaching to fit in with this framework, though his timeline is somewhat distorted on occasions. So when we come to chapter 23, we have to realise that these accusations against the temple and its hierarchy were most likely not said on the same occasion, but were rescheduled by Matthew to fit in with the theme of judgment. After all, there were friendly Pharisees such as Nicodemus and Gamaliel and others. And many of the temple authorities must have been sincere practising Jews. But it, it is important to note that Jesus' Jesus's criticisms were more often against the temple institution or culture or hierarchy or practices or hypocrisy rather than individual officials. And I, I will come back to that later. The Church Times, the official Church of England newspaper, of the 9th of October this year, devoted much space to the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse in the Anglican Church, IICSA as it's referred to. The report is a sickening liturgy of those who molested children and young people, but even more sickeningly, sickeningly it is a, a terrible reflection on how the institution has systematically covered up for the perpetrators and ignored the victims. And it, does, it has done so over many years. The extent of the problem was highlighted starkly in the number of cases reported in one year, 2017, to the National Safeguarding Panel an independent body set up to scrutinise and challenge the Church of England on the issue. There were 1,257 reports related to children and 2,030 relating to adults in this one year. The abuses were carried out by clergy, but not only clergy, but other lay people in positions of trust, such as leaders in youth clubs or choir masters. There is no doubt that this was 
and is an institutional problem that has been covered up by all levels of the church hierarchy. In the same edition of the Church Times, <clears throat> there were several articles by a variety of victims and experts. The problem of abuse was widened in these articles from just children and young adults to include older adults who had hitherto been stigmatised as vulnerable adults, suggesting that they had health or psychological or developmental problems. But some experts this very year have changed that uh, title or that description, um, saying that those adults were thought to have physical or psychological problems which led to the abuse, whereas in fact anyone can be the subject of abuse. The term was replaced by adults at risk of harm, and it can happen to anyone, as it depends on the circumstances. And the article pointed out it could be students at Oxford or Cambridge who cannot be said to be stupid or too immature. The report, the uh, independent uh, re investigation report is to be discussed at the General Synod at the end of uh, November. But as yet, the new term, adults at risk of harm, has not been adopted by the Church. <clears throat> it was pointed out by one writer that abuse occurs when there is an imbalance of power between the perpetrator and the victim such as clergymen and parishioners, or choirmaster and chorister, or even doctor and patient. And then there is a very famous one, isn't there, in the film industry, highlighted by the Harvey Weinstein saga. So, back to our reading. What Jesus was highlighting was mostly a cultural and an institutional problem. And it is useful that Matthew condensed these comments, presumably issued over a theory of ministry, into chapter 23 of his Gospel. And reading them, we would do well to reflect on what he might say of us and of our church today, not just in relation to the report on sexual abuse, but to all forms of abuse, such as abuse of power, in what is a strongly hierarchical organisation, as was the temple in Jerusalem. Are we adding to people's loads and shutting the door to the kingdom in people's faces? We must reflect deeply and critically on this. And a perusal of chapter 23 of Matthew's Gospel will stimulate many thoughts in this respect. Amen. <laughs>